and there were many days when actually I don't remember them. I don't remember what happened because I was so damn tired. And you reached a point where there was no beyond. You just could not go any further. All I could see was men lying dead, men screaming, men on the barbed wire with the bowers hanging down, shrieking, and I thought, what can I do? There were sheets and sheets in the paper of dead and wounded, uh, photographs where they could get them of the men, and I personally was brought out of class uh, to be told that, that my cousin had been killed. People didn't seem to realise, you know, what a terrible thing war was. You couldn't convey, you know, the awful uh, state of things. They just didn't understand it. The first, 1916, Jeremy Deller, when you were first approached by Jenny and said, create something, what was your first response? Well, often when you're asked to do things like this, your mind goes entirely blank and you <laughs> panic and that happened. And then about a week later, I was cycling along <laughs> Liverpool Road and I thought, what would, what would I like to see? What would I, what would I like to see someone else do? And then I thought, quite simply, I would like to see something that was mobile, involved human beings, moved around, had a randomness to it, was unexpected, was a secret, and was a way of taking the memorial to the public, rather than the public having to go to a place to be sad. They w it would be an intervention in their lives, mm -hmm. and they weren't expecting it, and they might not even be wanting it, but they would have to deal with it in some way. And that's, the idea was there, and that's probably 95% of the idea as it stood, and there's a few additions, but really that was it. Show some of your, you have some uh, images that you can t t tell us. Yes. What? Well, this, I mean, th these, my, this is the initial thinking in a way. It was a way to describe it rather than write it. It was a way to just put these, these are just two images of how I thought it could look or it should look. So you have these, are actually, you know, the black and white is obviously from 1916. And I just felt this is how it would look. But we didn't have quite have that weather in uh, mm -hmm. that day, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's how it would have looked if you had a bit of sun. And then, so things like this, and it's more or less what we got. We didn't, we didn't have the costumes in such a distressed state, because we didn't really want them to be sort of narrative, really, have a narrative with them. But it was basically this quality I was looking for, these people to be amongst the public and to surprise the public and to look very different from them and be in contemporary spaces. And that's, I mean, that's what we did. So this is, this is a picture I took at Waterloo Station of uh, one of the participants outside, pret manger And that's exactly what I wanted. I felt I wanted contemporary Britain to have these presences of these men around them. And what a stark contrast, a man with his rifle and a man with his mobile phone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so yeah, that, it, it's perfect, really, mm. for me. That was what I was hoping for. Mm. And, and Jenny, that, was that what you were hoping for? Yes. I th what we were hoping for is, I mean, I suppose I have the kind of luckiest job of anyone on the panel, it, which is to invite artists to create original and extraordinary things that will connect people with the First World War and act as, a, um, as an emotional con connection, I suppose. Not the history books, not the documentaries on telly, not the ceremonials that it are, are happening throughout the centenary, but connect people in a different way to the First World War and really kind of, as you were saying, get us thinking. So uh, when I invited Jeremy to have a bold and original and ambitious idea, I didn't quite expect it to be this scarily <laughs> ambitious. Um, but fortunately, uh, introducing him to Rufus and Rufus just kind of taking up the idea and uh, I suppose throwing not just your weight behind it, but also the whole of the National Theatre and then thinking actually this could this could be done by uh, by the theatres of this country which are brilliant and incredible and our role at 1480 now is to work with cultural organizations across the UK to deliver each of the projects so getting the three national theatres uh, getting so many of the regional reps who do you know the most amazing projects every uh, every night at 7.30 in all their theatres, but just get them to think in a completely different way and be led by a visual artist was, um, was uh, a, a, you know, was scary and ambitious, but actually it was the group of, of organisations that could pull it off. 
Ruth Fisker, you, you made history in, in telling history in the sense it was the first time, I understand, as Jenny mentions, first time three national theatres worked together on one huge project and then the, all the other local theatres which were brought together. She described it as scary. Which, is that the word you would use? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, challenging, certainly. Yeah, challenging, but this place is, um, you know, is amazing. I mean, it, last week... In, uh, in this theatre, we had a Connections Festival and in, in, the, um, uh, in the Olivier, which was, that's 500 youth theatres and schools groups all over the country. You know, these are networks that, that exist. Um, you know, I I in, the, in the house tonight, Porig, who's just down to the right here, who, who was charged with bringing all these people together, knows every theatre uh, and every theatre practitioner in the world. And... Uh, and it, the resource that's available here is, is incredible. I mean, I'm sure that's why Jenny came here first. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, it's not scary. No, it's about going, actually, are we going to do it? And the fantastic thing about being here is you go, yes, we can. And then you just get on with it. But it's, a, but it's one day across the whole country from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so many people who weren't, they're not trained actors and... Emily, you had the job of working with many of these people who came in, and tell us a little bit about, about that process, because I understand it was, that even that side of it was awesome. Yeah, so I suppose I was um, overseeing the different associate directors who were around the country and working in all the different theatres leading on the delivery of the project. Um, and then Jeremy and I had the massive privilege of going and meeting all of the participants who'd been gathered together for the project and jumped on board, taking a big leap of faith because they knew very little about what they were signing up to when they first signed up. I think the only thing we gave them was a nationwide project, award-winning team, and pretty not much else, was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so, so meeting people, and we had also designed together um, the rehearsal and out a sort of template rehearsal process that we felt um, would be a good way of coming to the performance language that we'd uh, devised together. So it was a combination of seeing people in the room, um, communicating with the directors through emails and lots of documentation and phone calls and meetings and things like that, but helping to ensure consistency of Jeremy's vision um, across the board. Because, they, I mean, they were, we were discussing earlier, it's like the, the men who, s who, who stand in the, in the searing heat, when there is searing heat, with those huge bear hats in front of Buckingham Palace and 10 Downing Street, and you go up and tease them, and they have to keep a, s a straight face. And uh, Rufus, I understand it was your idea that they should be silent. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the whole, the whole thing is a bit like, it's a bit akin, I'm a director, so I'm an interpretative artist. Jeremy's a creative artist, so... so Normally, I'd have a script or something to work with, and Jeremy would come with this idea. So, I in a way, the job was to just interrogate that a little bit and, and try and, you know, I think what Emily and I were doing, we were going, well, how about that? How about that? And Jeremy would, g would guide it as we went through. We did various, we did a workshop in Birmingham uh, 14 months a ago or a year ago, yeah. and then another one in Salisbury, each time trying out a little idea, and Jeremy would wa we'd all wander around. <coughs> He's got such a keen eye that, that it, it was really, um, it worked very well, didn't it, in yeah. that sense? Mm -hmm. And Emily's got such a wealth of experience of working with people who aren't trained actors that it, it felt like a good, a, a good trio. But they were Im amazingly responsive, weren't they? They Probably. were, and I, think, I suppose the challenge was what we were asking them to do was very, very restrained and very subtle. Mm. Um, and Jeremy sort of said right from the beginning, well, they need to just do nothing, uh, which is all very <laughs> well hard. for an artist to say, but not, for, not a good instruction for a director to give. Um, uh, so, so we had to come up with um, some really clever ways of, of making sure that the participants always felt active. Um, Le Jour was a really important part of that, I suppose. It's an exercise, an improvisational exercise, which... Um, uh, is about responding to your environment and to the people around you. And so we, we spent a lot of time seeding that in. And I mean, the directors around the country were just brilliant, though, and they came up with lots of really clever ways of interpreting what we'd given them and finding finding out how their what was going to make their particular group of participants respond. And I can tell you that what makes a farmer respond is different to what makes a student actor respond, which mm. is different to what makes a flight attendant or a barman respond, and that's the joy of it. It was so amazing. But we did, I should say as well, that we did often find that the people who had no training and no formal experience of the theatre were the ones that really stepped into it most naturally and most quickly because the language was so, so mm -hmm. gentle and um, we weren't giving anyone a big monologue to say or a, 
a big character to play. Mm. And it is an interesting reflection because, as you know, in, uh, especially for the day for the Battle of the Somme, a lot of them went to war as pals, as workmates. So they would have been on that day school, school friends, uh, flight attendants, people from all different walks of life. So it actually was a genuine uh, yeah. reenactment. And they weren't uh, professional soldiers yes. either. And they were exactly. At yes. that time, there was subscription. Uh, conscription, not yes. subscription, that's a theatre thing, conscription. But I think the other thing that came out of it at the end for the participants is that they had felt like they'd been in some sort of pals battalion, that actually they they said afterwards that they would have done anything for each other, that they and they had a way of communicating because they were completely silent. And obviously there was a, a very clever, brilliantly uh, directed stage management system of when they moved and when they stopped and when they sang and so on. But that that the participants had said that they had felt connected to each other and knew what to do next and how everyone mm. was feeling. Well, I think we should give a word to those who were, who were part of it. Farag, I think you have a microphone. Does, I, I know we have here some of the soldiers who were on that day in uniform. I'm not checking into Pret-a-Manger when someone <laughs> wasn't looking. Would, would tell you, what's your name? My name's Peter. I, was, I had a card uh, representing rifleman George Edward Morris, who died at the age of 20 oh. on that day. And so what, how did it feel like? You've heard everyone here describing what it felt like. What, what did it feel like for you? You were the man on the spot. Well, I'm a science teacher, so everything they've said about making it accessible to people who are not trained in acting was very definitely true. The language was very helpful. We did have some direction in terms of we had symbol, uh, signals for whether we were going to stand together, spread out, uh, stagger ourselves across a station, for example. Um, I was in Waterloo. And it was just a very, very moving experience. That's Waterloo, by the way. You're there somewhere. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Yeah, so. I mean, did you really feel, once you put the uniform on, and you knew it was July the 1st, did you find you went completely into trying to be in, this, in the sense of that day? Well, we'd spent several weeks leading up to it, in which we'd been doing warm-up games and doing drill and encouraging each other through that. So it started off quite light-hearted, um, although, of course, we had some a wonderful lecture, actually, on the Somme, uh, mm. to, get, to get us started. And then once we started giving cards out to members of the public and demanding a response from them by our presence, it really hit home what we were doing and it was in incredibly moving. And that's continued to this day. I had a message just this last weekend of a friend who on Twitter had a message from a historian posting a photo of the rifleman that he represented and saying that she's now got in contact with the family oh. and will be giving a photo of him on that day to the family. And before this project, did you know much about July the 1st, what had happened at the Somme? I had a great-grandfather who was involved in the First World War and I didn't even know about it. Hmm. Um, so it, it made me find out a lot more um, about the battle. Hmm. I, I knew very little. Hmm. How many of you before July the 1st, 2016, thought a lot, knew a lot about what happened July the 1st, uh, 1916, on the, on the Battle of the Somme. Just a show of hands, how much, how many of you knew before? Quite a few of you. How many of you knew more after <laughs> July the 1st, 2016? Hands up, everyone, <laughs> 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 the, Was anyone else a soldier on that day would like to, to say something? Okay. Hello. Um, yeah, um, well, we were all part of the same group here. Oh, how um, many of you are there? There was three, three of us here. Where were yeah. you? Um, we were at Euston in the morning, and then we traveled to Milton Keynes, and then we came back then to Waterloo. Um, I represented a private, Alexander Bell, who was, I believe, I'm not sure the exact regiment, but he was a Scotsman. Okay. Um, what I, f I really felt was great on the day was, I, I semi-expected it, but not to the level, was on the day of the, of the real impact it had on the public. Um, I was just saying to a friend of mine today, who's actually a, um, an ex-serviceman, and he was just sort of asking me about the experience, and of course I had to be very secretive about the whole project. Um, so finally he saw it on his television when he was up in, up in Leeds, and he came down today and he was like absolutely blown away by the whole project. And I was telling him today um, about an example of, I was standing at outside Euston Station, I believe, and I saw a lady across the road and she'd already started breaking down into tears, Aww. and she was holding eye contact with me the whole time as I was with her, sharing this moment. And she came over to me and sort of asked, are you a Scotsman? And of course, this 
it's very difficult not to respond to somebody when they're having that emotional connection with you. But at the same time, there still was a connection. Did you um, respond? Because you were told to remain silent. What, what did you choose to well, do? Well, at that point, I'd handed her the card mm. and, and obviously good. sort of stayed with her. And, and as she read it, she looked up and sort of gave me a nod and sort of was a bit more teary and walked off. But I mean, that for me really summed up the whole experience. It was that being able to reach out to the public and, and being in a public space and putting a face on these men that a lot of us knew nothing about. Um, and that was just an example. There was many of those different experiences throughout the day. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was kind of mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I got involved in, I think, for many of us as well. We all had damn stories to tell each other at the end of the day, so. Thank you very much. Was really Does good. any of you have any questions you'd like to ask any of the, these great I'd minds behind us? Yeah. I was not expecting the reaction that the public mm -hmm. gave us. I was, we were, you know, we did all these training exercises of what if kids run after you, what if someone nicks your hat, what if someone takes the piss out of you, mm. and all of this. And we were just, even on the Shetland Islands, they were worried about it. You know, probably mm. a crime-free <laughs> part of Britain. They spent ages talking about it. And then when it came to it, it, it probably happened a bit, but the reaction of the public, you know, really took... It was really incident-free? I, I think in Northern Ireland, you know, in Derry, there's a few things Surely said to people, right you know. But, yeah. Yeah, but not not I mean, it's not surprising. No, I mean, and we went specifically, I was very keen, but we didn't ignore that part of the UK as well. I think it was very important that we went there. And it was always going to be different. But but it was amazing, that reaction. I wasn't expecting it. And we, we were talking about it earlier. It was. I suspect it was because we just had two of our most horrible weeks in British public life, mm. in a way, where people were willing to sacrifice their country for themselves or for their their ego or vanity. And then you have this thing where people have kind of sacrificed their lives for their country. So it was this total inversion of what what we'd been through for the last two or three weeks, this sort of tra trauma almost, I would say. Um, but it was it surprised me. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, weirdly, uh, originally I'd written in my book, I, uh, I, I hope you won't thank me for saying this, I wrote in the, the notebook, I said, I want to make children cry mm -hmm. because I just <laughs> thought it would be, be quite interesting to to not to frighten children as such, but to unsettle <laughs> them. But we seem to make a lot of adults yes. cry rather than children. Do you, know, you realise Rufus has a contract which says, please don't make children yeah, cry? Well, <laughs> I know. But it was interesting. So it took yeah. me by surprise. Well, that's a, that, that's but a, in a good way. part of art as well. That yeah. Does anyone, we don't have microphones, but if you, d s you can speak loud and I'll be, your, I'll be your microphone if we can't hear. This is the lady in the back. So did you feel that you were, as a woman, you, you couldn't relate because it was such a male? I felt that they couldn't relate hmm. because it was such a male thing. And I also felt that they couldn't relate because they were all women and they were all men. And they were all men and hmm. they were all men and they were all men. Oh, interesting. So it was like, you know, I don't think that the fact that they were all men was a problem. I think that they were all men. Do you want to talk about So yes, so, so a question then from, from a woman. What is your name? Sarah, from, from Sarah, who, who approaches, of course, 1916, women were not serving in the army. It's interesting that there's just been a decision to allow women to, f to serve in close combat roles. How does a woman engage with, the, with this kind of performance art when it was so male, and of course it's about war, and you f found a hard time, and, but in a sense she put herself in the shoes of the women of the time, who may, some of whom may have wanted to serve. Jenny, because I know we talked a little bit about... Well, we did yeah. have that discussion. In fact, the Birmingham um, mm. uh, test day that you mentioned, Rufus, had m young men and women in uh, Second World War uniform. We didn't want to kind of uh, break the secret I at that early stage, but um, it was a very interesting discussion that we had with a number of theatre directors from around the country, and Jeremy and you, Rufus and Emily, about whether to include women participants as well as men. Mm. But I don't, I think, in answer to your question, I don't think it was part of your, it feels like the decision to not have women was very clearly just because it didn't 
it didn't suit the vision, did it? Mm. We, it th unfortunately, the women in uniform looked like women in uniform, and the public responses, it was really important to test, and the public responses were unfortunately quite negative, and, and there was quite a lot of um, Larry response, and um, some people got followed a little bit, and it just, it just wasn't saying the right thing. And it, I, So I think it was it wasn't so much that you'd hoped that women would receive it that way, although that's a really interesting, beautiful way that uh, you came to it as a woman, um, but it was more practical than that. Would you agree, Jeremy, Yeah. I think? I mean, it, it, yes, it, it, just, it just wasn't gonna work, unfortunately, but um, one of the, when I was researching the project, there was, a, there was this huge phenomenon of women seeing their dead loved ones in the streets of, of, of major cities mainly out the corner of their eyes. So in a way, it's kind of inspired by the, the responses of women often seeing their husband or their brother or their son. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this was a huge thing. And it led people onto spiritualist churches mm -hmm. and seances where they would be uh, often sort of totally ripped off by unscrupulous people saying that they could contact these people who they had visions of, basically. So that was a very strong part of the idea, really, for this sort of, this sort of presence on, on the streets. But they weren't playing ghosts. I know that word has been used a lot mm. in the press, yes. but there's nothing you can do about that. They weren't ghosts. They weren't zombies, anything like that. Mm. But I suppose that was the power. They were real, breathing human beings, and th that yes. was that was the greatness of it. I think mm. that. We get another question. Yes, the gentleman. Congratulations to everyone that's involved. Mm, I think yes. it means all of us. Well done, all. <laughs> My question to both of you this morning is how do you balance uh, interest in this? And to John, because we see this again and again, uh, this analogy in other worlds when it comes up. Mm. You know, but uh, uh, Jeremy, how do you find it to be seen as being so much more than a monthly thing, which is going to be kept in the church as part of the church? Ah, <laughs> okay. So, uh, a question, let's go to you, Rufus, first, whether or not you think this could be, it, it had such an impact, could you do it again? Um, and then I'll go to you, could you, Jeremy? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond on behalf of the award-winning artist, Jeremy Della. Mm -hmm. I, I think you'll find he never does anything twice. So, uh, the simple answer is, would you do this again for another historical event? No, you wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know, I don't suppose you would. Um, in terms of... Because you want surprise, right? You, it has to be... Otherwise, it becomes too predictable, and then... Yeah. Well, the secrecy thing was yeah. massively important. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, because everyone was taken idea. by it, and... Yeah. In terms of... In terms of... Is there a play about this <laughs> moment in our political history? There'll be loads. Yeah. The thing is that you can't... What, it generally, generally speaking, no, the dust has to settle a lot more before people can really... I mean, we're on the set of a play that is about... Uh, Greece in response to uh, in response to the um, coup d'état, um, uh, you know, set in the in the in most of it in the seventies. So that sometimes it takes a long time to look back on things. The, the, I what I think the legacy of this will be for this theatre in a way, and interestingly, um, in in a broader context, uh, Emily is. Um, is a fantastic community theatre director, and one of the reasons that she's come on board uh, and is with us for the next couple of years is to is to uh, kind of spearhead um, a, a part of theatrical performance work that we haven't this theatre hasn't done much of in the past. Together with uh, well Flo, who's here at the moment, and our fantastic learning department, it, it is an area that we're we're very very keen to engage in more, and we're. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about it in any detail, but we're getting involved in quite a big response, I think, in a very, very different way to, to what's going on politically now, uh, more on, on the kind of community theatre front. But I don't... Um, I, yeah, the plays... The, 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 the brilliant plays that are written about this period of time, I, I suspect, will be written after I've been booted out of here. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Over to... What do you, what do you think? I think theatre is very good at reacting to current events or recent history. It's better than arts, almost. I would say, um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it again. But I'm happy for people to do something similar again. Uh, I would say, and we actually, I don't know if, if I can say, if yeah. someone in New Zealand asked if they could do something similar for a commemoration of a battle there, and I'm just let them get on with it, basically. 
Mm. That's just, you know, there's an idea. <laughs> You're going to do Take a new it. thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to be bothered, really, administering this idea. Uh, <laughs> I just want to go on with something else. But <laughs> yeah. Yours now, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you. For the good, very good. You couldn't do a theatre based on what's happening now because no one would believe it. They'd say the plot is too <laughs> fantastic. Yes, yes. Hmm? Oh, ah. question. Yeah, possibly, uh, thank you for sharing the thesis, but actually, um, yeah, this is a, a joint study that uh, Jack Paul and Ben Byrne have done together with Jenny. I was especially uh, blown away by the emphasis of his work on a woman mm. who's described as a handsome and a smart feminist Okay. It would have been great to enter that manuscript. They tried to find information about it. Some um, online historians have posted online threads information and, you know, all sorts of... Mm. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. The, see, the project lives on through, through your own social media interaction. I wonder, was mm. it, was it this question for you, Jenny? Was it part of the original idea, or was it, Jeremy, that you, it would have this ripple effect? The question was, of course, about whether... The, yes. the response, yes. which continues yes. to resonate. It was absolutely part of your idea. I mean, uh, Jeremy's idea was that no one would know about it until it happened, and then everyone would know about it. And uh, so we had um, a, a, a very unusual marketing brief for an uh, incredible team, some of whom are here uh, today. So to answer your question, the social media reach has been phenomenal. Uh, we set ourselves a kind of target of reaching... 65 million impressions on social media. I think at the moment it's at 220 million impressions wow. and growing. Um, there's a little film on the BBC Arts Online which has had about 1.8 million views. Um, it's, uh, I, I think our, we did some YouGov polling last week and 63% of the population, 63% of the adult population of the UK are aware of We Are Here and we're aware of it either live, 2 million, or 30 million of them through media and social media. So the plan was um, to have, we ha uh, the National Theatre again gave us an extraordinary room somewhere in the depths of somewhere here, which we called the control room, which I thought was quite uh, kind of uh, uh, appropriate. We should have called it the command and control room probably. <laughs> um, and there was a team on social media which was uh, w which was getting the story out, and there was a team on social media which was stopping anything that could possibly tell anyone that it was an artwork. <laughs> so anyone who mentioned Jeremy's name, anyone who mentioned the National Theatre, Birmingham Rep, anything, um, Erica, who's here on the r in the room, managed to get hold of people, and so did Cathy and the whole of the team, to just take down any post that would give the game away, mm -hmm. so that when people encountered a soldier, they didn't immediately think, oh, that's the artwork that everyone's talking about. They thought, oh, someone said something about a soldier, and now I'm seeing it, and mm -hmm. now I'm going to take a photograph and share it. So there was an online life for it, which has continued for, well, the last mm -hmm. week and a half. Mm -hmm. And who, Jeremy, was your idea that they would hold the, the card? Because Rufus, I th if I'm correct, it was the silence, but the cards, where, where, where did that come from? Was that in discussions with you? I always thought there should be a card. Mm. People should be given something. It's like a gift. Because mm. we heard an interesting example of someone who you want to say something to them, and the card becomes a very powerful way to yeah. communicate. It's basically like a gravestone. Yeah. You know, oh. On a card, in a sense. We didn't realize it. When wow. we, but when you look at it, you think, oh, it's all the information you see on a gravestone. And they were just giving those out, and that was again. This had this random quality to it. Mm. We do have someone here who could tell about, tell you about the names. Is Anna? Is Anna here? Anna, <laughs> okay. Anna was costume, but also researched the names, and she could tell you how wow, she went that about it. Uh, um, yeah. How so many names altogether? Um, one and a half thousand okay. names. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was along with Helen 
uh, the, one of the costume supervisors for the whole project. So I was responsible for the uniforms, but I also, because of the differences between the uniforms based on regiments, based on battalions, um, ended up with this job of finding one and a half thousand names of all of these soldiers. Um, and you were saying that it would be good to put the name into a website. That's absolutely something you can do. Um, I went through, sort of supported by the Imperial War Museum, um, went through a website called the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, which has compiled all of the data of all of the graves of all of the soldiers that we know about from the First and Second World War. Um, and uh, came at it from that angle and uh, spent a long time looking at the regiments that were there on the first day of the Somme and then finding all of the war dead from every regiment that we had selected, which were from all around the country, so that um, the idea was that a lot of the soldiers would be geographically appropriate for the men who died, so the participants had names of people who were from the area that they were in. Um, yeah. Very good. Well, that's an amazing job she did, I have to yeah. say. Mm, no. Phenomenal. Is it phenomenal? Yes, yeah. <laughs> So, Jeremy, whether there was a political message beyond just commemorating the war? Not in a kind of party political way, obviously, but probably, if anything, it was more about what uh, maybe what art and theatre is capable of doing rather than being anti-war. I was just trying to push the, the, the sort of possibilities of, of doing an, a national celebration. So maybe it was political in the fact, but it wasn't. It didn't involve the royal family, it didn't involve... Uh, church service or a, a monument where people go and feel overtly sentimental about something or sad about something. So maybe with a small p, it was trying to redefine what a memorial could be to a war, but it was definitely, I wouldn't say it was necessarily anti-war as such, um, um, but it clearly has that within it. Um, but I don't know if that's really answering your question. Mm, it but feels like one of the things you said most often when we went on our visits was... Um, was exactly that, was a, there shouldn't be any sentimentality about it. And the, no. the lack of narrative also felt political with a small p. Mm. But there was never, there was a very small climax at the end of the day, but it was never about telling a story and it was never about commenting on um, the characters of these men. Mm. It was a more oblique statement than that. But of course, when you, know, when you work in the public realm with the public, they bring their own interpretation mm. of something. So they could have brought something quite sentimental, I'm sure some people did, but I wasn't looking for that. I was thinking for something slightly more shocking or, or surprising. I think that's, that's what I was hoping for. And they actively avoided any war memorials or churches or anything mm. that had that kind of feeling about oh. it. Much more to do with uh, Ikea or mm. you know, Westfield Starbucks Shopping Centre and mm. stuff, you know. Mm. And some of the places where they would have gathered that, that well, they would have been got, they'd be at the front, but they would have gathered there be as they were going to the front, train stations. Mm. And yeah. yeah, but I really wanted to go to contemporary places and mm. look odd and look out of place mm. and strange and uh, s maybe even unsettling mm. to have it going through uh, going through Westfield or in a Tesco's car park mm. or something. That's what I wanted them to do. So, you know, wars seem so far away and distant. And um, well, I suppose when you have troops serving in Afghanistan and Iraq, they do come home. But that was a great war that affected small towns that where mm. everyone was affected. And so I think we have time for one. Very good. Yes. And then we'll take one. We'll just take two and then um, we didn't take because we have to be out of here sharp at quarter two, very quickly. Yep. We'll do okay, we're going to just very quickly. One second here, here. Okay, Carol. How is there a relationship between war and the Commonwealth? You know, it's kind of an established fact that it is. And so people from all around the world who served in the Second World War, is there going to be a celebration of your creative work around the world? Mm, interesting. Yeah. Just That's not up for me, really. If people want to repeat it as a project, like I was saying earlier, they can. It's, but it might happen. Hmm. New Zealand has asked them already, but the question was whether in Commonwealth countries they might want to recreate it. And yes, the lady here.
<laughs> that's, that's, that's the real enemy. <laughs> and how they got the trains to run on time that day. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, yeah. I mean that. So how did you, you know, how did you get permission from Network Rail? All and right. how did you keep it secret? So many people were involved, yeah. Sorry, so uh, all the permissions. So someone here that could tell you if she wants to speak, but she might not want to speak. This is Jen this who is did. Jen Crick. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. Of Jen, you start with the <laughs> thing. Okay, so... Um, Permissions wise, we were lucky actually that uh, Network Rail had some association already with 1480 now, so we had a good link there. But permissions wise, we were kind of um, playing a fine line between uh, asking for permission and begging for forgiveness. So <laughs> there, were, there were some key people we went to that we knew we had to, you know, big railway stations um, where we had the convergences, but we tried to not tell many people about it at all. So, you know, it was really limited in terms of who we got permission from. Um, what was the other? <laughs> Stage <laughs> management. Can I just Stage. say, the only yeah. place in the UK where we were denied uh, access was Canary Wharf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if, you know, if I'd have thought about it and known that beforehand, I would just said, just go there, don't, don't ask <laughs> these <laughs> idiots, yeah. just do it. I mean, um, we had, we had like yeah. several tiers of information. So for people at Network Rail, we brought them in quite early on to the whole project. Um, but others, we would just tell them really limited stuff, like someone will turn up in a costume on this day. So there's absolutely no sort of revealing information. Um, but in terms of the stage management, we were working, as you were saying, with 27 partners around the country, all of whom had uh, amazing teams, amazing stage managers, and they were all um, amazing at kind of dealing with the route planning in their own locations. So I think it was something like 900 places that we went to in total. Um, and all of that was done regionally. So we were sort of guiding from, from here, if you like, but a lot of that work was done by those teams on the ground. Um, and, and same with the volunteer management. There were some incredibly enthusiastic um, salespeople, really, who went out into uh, community groups, shopping centres, um, sort of every single community that you can imagine. There was a team of people going out there and trying to persuade them to get involved with something where they knew nothing about what they were going to be signing up for. And that's what was really remarkable when we went around on all the visits was, uh, was seeing what people had walked through the door to without even knowing what they were, what they were taking part in. Mm. It was incredible. Good. And question of secrecy, you, you mentioned a bit, Jenny, you were watching online to make sure any words came out that you, you shut them down. Just very quickly, was there any other measures you had to use, or Rufus and Emily, to make sure nobody... Court marshals. Yeah, <laughs> because that's also yeah. partially connected to the volunteers' question. Everyone yeah. mustn't burst yeah. to tell their, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their someone, their mother. The volunteers were amazing. They all had to sign a confidentiality agreement, after, after which they were told more details about the project. But we took a lot of inspiration from the Olympics opening ceremony and this idea that if people buy into a secret with you, mm. they can really own that secret. And I don't know if you guys would agree, but I think um, from what we saw, the incredible participants just went, this is ours. We understand Jeremy's vision. We understand why the secrecy is completely fundamental to that. Uh, and we're going to own that and enjoy that. Mm. But just keeping them off social media was yeah. pretty extraordinary. I think yeah. the theatres do have this... The, the, the network of the 27 theatres have amazing learning and participation teams as well as amazing stage management teams and they used all the knowledge that they've built up over years and years to put into effect on this project and i think that that buying in and keeping a secret was was pretty extraordinary the other organization that did that actually was the bbc so your organization mm -hmm. lise there was a small team led by john t um who is here yeah um which uh, kept it a secret from all their colleagues, but, but somehow managed to get regions and nations TV, local radio, Radio One, social media, Scotland, Northern Ireland, incredible coverage. And mm. one of the reasons I think that we were able to get to so many people in the country was the regions and network news, regional news of the BBC. So from between 6.30 and 7, they played out the films that they'd been uh, recording all day, just following the roots of the soldiers, and they were the very few people mm. that we let into the secret. 
Good. I have to say, in th more than 30 years with the BBC was the first time ever I've been asked to sign a secrecy agreement. <laughs> so, I was, so they said, some big cultural figure, and I thought, is it Beyonce? Is it Beyonce? <laughs> Who's demanding secrecy? Well, in Plymouth, <laughs> yeah, in Plymouth the they <laughs> yeah. knew there was an artist involved, and the guys in Plymouth thought it was Kanye West. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, I join me in thanking this great creative team for what you did create for all of us. And a thank you to all of you who were part of your creation. Thank you very Thank much. You.